welcome back to the darker side of boxing and today's episode is all about going inside the mind of Ike Abayabuchi. This is one that me and Johnston, we've been looking forward to this one for a long time. We've had this one up our sleeves for quite a while and we're really happy to present Ike Abayabuchi's story to you in this episode. It's a very topsy-turvy story which still hasn't really been concluded. But what we're going to do for this episode is we're going to give you this this life, these crazy times and, and really get into the mind of a heavyweight which could have been a world champion three or four times over. But he's got one hell of a story behind him and I hope you guys really enjoy this. Johnston, this is the one you've been looking forward to the most. The one that really tells us some really dark moments and some really, really crazy moments in the life of Ike Abuchi. Ike Rumba. Ike, it, it, honestly, it is, it's a crazy story. If you if you haven't heard this story of Ike Ibayabuchi, then um, all I'm saying is, is um, you're in for a treat, a real treat. It is a compelling story, a story about a guy, as you said, possibly a heavyweight contender to compete with Lennox Lewis, Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield. And it just went Pete Tong. The whole thing fell to pieces and wow, what a story. And this is, it's, it's, it was a possibility for the dark side of boxing season one. I'm glad we held back because this is a belter for season two. Oh my goodness. Ike is, it's just a messed up story. You're going to love it. And there are going to be some really dark stuff in there. Obviously, it's dark side of boxing. So, yeah, if, if, you, if you're not into that kind of thing, then unfortunately, you'd have to turn off. There, are, there is a few bits in here that um, a, a bit maybe a bit too dark if, if you're a bit squeamish. A, a great story. So that is pretty much the disclaimer straight away from Johnston. If you are squeamish, if there are stories that will offend you, if there is anything that may offend you coming out of this story, then please switch off now. But if you like us and you love your true crime, you love your boxing, you love your crazy stories, then this is the place to be inside the mind of Ike Abayabuchi. And we're going to begin with a story told by an American named Gary Edwards in 1967 who was travelling across Europe before serving as a Marine in Vietnam. Now, he recalled encountering a man who went by the name of the Peace Star Killer and who was also travelling with his manager on a train from Toulon to Marseille. Edwards wrote, They came into our little booth on the train. They were both in suits and sat down. He looked very weird, the black guy, the pista killer. There was a cone of hair coming down the front of his head and sticking out. We started talking to his manager, who looked like an Italian, he showed me his scrapbook and there were all these crazy photos of the pista killer. A whole bunch of pictures. Pictures of him lifting people up, pulling against 15 or so people on the other end of a rope and picking up these amazing weights with his hair. I was thinking, this can't be real. I never knew someone could be that strong. And he just sat there, the pista killer. He didn't speak at all. Now that man, whose real name was Samson Abeyabuche, hailed from Ngodo Esuche in Umanuche, LGA of Abia State. A strong man in his day who carried four able men on his body in a suspended style for more than five minutes without shaking. When just 17, he pulled cars with his hair, lifted 80 kilos of fresh logwood, won several strongman competitions when he became the first to be able to carry 12 bags of 50 kilo cement on his body. Now the Pista Killer's legendary status skyrocketed when he defeated another legendary figure in Kaliwi Naguachiwu in a fight before lifting him up with one hand for more than 20 seconds. World Samson Pista Killer was so friendly to many. Loved by children, feared by his friends and today a statue commemorates him as a folk hero. He was also known as the Lion of Izuchi or Superman, but whose real name was Abeyabuchi, the father of Akemfula, Charles Abeyabuchi, aka Ike. So the folklore of Samson Abeyabuchi, well, it sounds like some sort of fairy tale, uh, but, but living in Nigeria six years on from that Gary Edwards story was anything but. Five years before Ike 
Ibayabuchi was born on February the 2nd, 1973. Nigeria were in the middle of a civil war fought between the government of Nigeria and the Republic of Biafra, a revolutionary state which had declared its independence from Nigeria in 1967. Now, during the two and a half year war, there were about 100,000 military casualties and between half a million and two million Biafran civilians died of starvation. The leader of Nigeria Peace Conference delegation said in 1968 that starvation is a legitimate weapon of war and we have every intention of using it against the rebels. The federal Nigerian army is accused of further brutalities, including deliberate bombing of civilians, mass slaughter with machine guns and rape. It has been argued that the Biafran war was genocide, which no perpetrators have, have ever been held accountable for. And well, the aftermath, as always with these wars, cost many lives. The country's finances were in tatters and the infrastructure crumbled. Ike Ibiabuchi actually told a guy called Joe Santo Liquito of Ring Magazine in 1999 that he actually never felt the effects of this war, saying, I didn't grow up in Nigeria. I thought I did, but I grew up here in the United States. I was 19 when I came to the United States, but I feel grown right now. And what I know now, I didn't know then in Nigeria. So that's growing up to me. <laughs> it was okay in Nigeria. It wasn't an easy country at all. It's not like here. It's ruled by the military. It, it, some of his quotes, by the way, are quite difficult at times because <laughs> uh, he's not quite with it at times. But although he's very intelligent, we, you'll get the gist in a minute. But his version of events does correspond with our sources because his father's work did require that the family would travel frequently. And he did spend two years in Ghana, where he actually attended nursery school. Ike's mother, Patricia Abeyabuchi, raised him and her other children to be a devout Christian. She once said that, as a preacher of God's word, I raised Ike and my other children to know what God's word says and that we are to live our lives according to the word of God. When the family returned from Ghana, Ike went to a state school called Housing Estate Primary School and he loved to wrestle and play football or soccer for our American listeners. And it was in the book, President of Pandemonium, The Mad World of Ike Abuchi, where the author, Luke G. Williams, described his intellect. And he said, at his high school, Emmanuel College, Uweri, Abeyabuchi did well academically, majoring in sciences and developing the ambition to be a doctor. He hoped to work with his mother, who was a nurse. Luke continued, and he said, by the time Abeyabuchi graduated in 1989, his medical ambitions had faded, and he attempted to enrol as a cadet at Kaduna's Nigerian Defence Academy, only to be rejected. His mum then decided to move to the United States in 1990, leaving Ike behind in Nigeria. While staying at his uncle's house, Ike witnessed a moment that would change his life forever. He sat by the television set, stunned, along with the rest of the boxing world, as Mike Tyson lost for the first time ever to Buster Douglas in Tokyo. Of course, you can check out our legendary night on that particular episode if you haven't heard it already. After witnessing the fall of Tyson, Ike remembers his uncle telling him, if I were younger, I would have become a boxer. Those simple words sparked something inside of a young Ike, and he later admitted, I never knew someone could beat Tyson, and when he lost to Buster Douglas, it made me think, I could be a champion. He's a great man. I never thought he could be subdued. And it was from that moment that Ike decided that he would become a boxer. I mean, he stood at six foot two, and had all the physical attributes necessary to be a force in the heavyweight division. Before joining his mother in the States, Ike actually began fighting in Nigeria, winning several local tournaments, including the amateur Imo State Super Heavyweight title, and represented Nigeria in several international tournaments, even winning an invitational event in Santu, China in 1992. His best performance as an amateur came when he defeated Duncan Dokai Wari, twice he beat this guy, who would actually later win a bronze medal in the super heavyweight division in the 1996 Atlanta Games. By 1993, he decided the time was right to progress his boxing career. So he headed to Dallas, Texas to live with his mother. 
It was through a guy called Jack Webb, a member of his mother's church, where Ike met a guy called Curtis Coates, a former world welterweight champion turned trainer at the House of Champions gym in Oakcliffe. Coates recalled in a 2010 interview with Trish Dixon for Boxing News at the time, uh, the moment that he actually met Ike. His mother brought him to me. He was a fine student, learned real fast, and he wanted you to teach him something new every day. Well, under the tutelage of Copes, Ike made a significant improvement in his technical skills. His technical skills were obviously a little bit off, but he was a big guy. He had all the fundamentals there. And the Canadian heavyweight was Kirk Johnson, who sparred with Ike, gives all of the credit to his trainer. And in his words, he said, Curtis changed Ike. After Curtis worked with Ike for two or three months, he was a totally different fighter. I was still getting the upper hand, but I had to pull everything out of my socks to win rounds. Curtis made him that much of a change. One of the biggest things Curtis taught him was patience. To start with, Ike never had no patience. After two rounds, he would be done. But Curtis was able to slow him down. He got him to throw easy punches for a while to save energy until the time was right to throw the harder punches. But not all the credit should go to his trainer because Ike worked his ass off as well to make sure he could accomplish his dream by training six or even seven days a week. Cox told the ring in 1997, early on he was a bit awkward. I had to take him to school. A lot of fighters are resistant to that, but he never was. His mind is like a sponge when it comes to boxing. I've never seen a man work harder in the gym. He continued his amateur career Ike in the United States for a very brief period, winning the 1994 Dallas Regional Golden Gloves and the Texas State Championship. It is reported that Ike finished his amateur career with a record of 27-1, and but realistically, he would have fought more while he was in Nigeria. Before coming professional, Abeya Bucci had already picked up his nickname, the President, given to him by a group of local fans in a nod to the former president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, also known as Ike, the 34th President of the United States. At the age of 21, Ike made his professional debut at the Expo Hall in Shreveport, Louisiana on October 13th, 1994, against the Mexican Ishmael Garcia, who resided in San Antonio, Texas. But before the fight, Ike was quick to make comparisons with himself and his inspiration Mike Tyson, telling the Shreveport Times... When I was fighting internationally, people said I was a Tyson lookalike. Some people in Nigeria and even here in America, the places I've been say, he does things like Mike Tyson. That boosts my morale. He also went on to speak of his strongman and famous father and he said, I inherit my strength from him. Now to the fight, and Ike showed his strength, stopping his fellow debutant in just 19 seconds in the second round. Well, that is first professional winner. It can't be viewed anywhere online. Uh, the reports on the bout are limited, but Luke G. Williams, the author of the Ike Abuchi book, did manage to get the perspective of Ike's opponent, who was Garcia. And Garcia reported that I stunned him in the first round. I remember seeing it in his eyes. After the bell, I turned to walk to my corner and he hit me on the back of the head. I had quite a few amateur fights, and that was the first time I'd seen stars. The referee actually wanted to disqualify him for hitting after the end of the round. But my coach said, no, 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 he'll be all right. By the next round, I was still dazed. He came out, started punching me, and the fight was stopped. I would have given him a run for his money if I'd have never been hit on the back of the head. Well, irrelevant of what happened that night, Ike won his first professional fight. And he said afterwards, this is just a step to climbing the ladder. Indeed, that was exactly what that fight was. The first step towards his dream of becoming a world heavyweight champion. Two months later, Ike won a points decision over a guy called Calvin Lampkin in Fort Worth, Texas to end 1994. Now, after taking Christmas off, Ike was back in the ring in January, stopping Ron McGowan in three rounds. And then he actually took a points win in his first six round, though, against a guy called Keith Walton after knocking him down twice. Then in his fifth fight, Ike got a third round knockout of a guy called Martin Lopez in the very first round. 
Uh, he's making a decent start to his professional career at this moment, but he was no ed headline act. That honour would belong to a guy called, we've spoke about before, Paul Lee Ayala, who topped all of Ike's fights, all of his bills up until that point. Although in the mind of Ike Iabuchi, he was more than just a supporting act. His next fight was organised by Richard Lord, the son of Doug who had managed Curtis Cox for his whole boxing career. Cox was eager to get Ike further publicity so he called up Richard and said he had a guy who he would love and could he get him a fight. Richard trusted and respected Cox so arranged a fight against the undefeated Terry Porter at the Music Hall in Austin, Texas on August 25th, 1995. Ike was given a set amount for expenses Basically, his accommodation at the hotel and a meal after his weigh-in. On the morning of the fight, Richard Lord arrived at the hotel. And this is his account of what happened. And he said, A load of people from Dallas had showed up to see Ike fight. And somehow, he had persuaded the guy on night duty to move him into a suite. Then he ordered a large amount of liquor and food to put a party on. He convinced the hotel I was responsible and I was going to pay for it all. The hotel said to me, hey, you've got this bill from last night run up by Ike Abayabuchi. And then we'd run up quite a bill, probably around $1,200. I got them to call him down and I said to Ike, look, I don't pay for any of this stuff. This is bullshit. And Ike replied, I am the president. I don't discuss these matters. You must discuss it with my manager. He wouldn't even talk about it. At the time, I was very agitated, but he was insistent. Now, to resolve this issue, Cox told Lord to deduct the cost from his fight purse, which, of course, he was happy to do, and he said, you always expect fighters to do dumbass shit. As long as the managers or trainers take care of it, I roll with it. <laughs> well, I love Richard Lord, mate. He, he, <laughs> uh, he didn't take no shit there, but Richard Lord gave his honest opinion on what he thought about Ike's personality at the time. And this is something that will develop over the course of this episode. And he said whenever he was in trouble, he would always refer to himself in the third person as the president. He really thought he was the president of wherever he was president of. He really played the part of royalty. He was wild and crazy dude. Well, clearly I was starting to demonstrate some interesting behavior. And Cox did admit as well that we always knew that he had some problems, but they were never that serious and they were always kept quiet. Well, away from these problems, everything seemed to be going well under the guidance of Cox. Even Richard Lord appreciated Ike's hot potential. He said that he was a devastating puncher, a great fighter and one tough son of a gun. I was always anticipating he would be a world champion. You could see he had what it would take and he did what Curtis said. Curtis was a master trainer and Ike had a good relationship with him. He performed for Curtis. Now that was proven once again when he did fight, eventually, Terry Porter, the undefeated 4-0 guy who retired in his corner after the third round. Ike was then back on the Pooley Ayala undercard for his next fight against another undefeated fighter in Greg Kidd Chocolate Pickram. He was a uh, 4-0-1. He had the one draw on his record at the Will Rogers Coliseum in Fort Worth, Texas on September 9, 1995. Now, during the first round, Pickram landed a right hand that sent Iabuchi down to one knee, but the referee, Lawrence Cole, failed to record it as a count. Kid Chocolate recalled the moment that it happened. He said, in the first round, I hit him. He touched down, and I think he just got the nod on that. The fight concluded for another two rounds when referee eventually stopped it in the third. Pickram recalled the finish. And he said, I was winning on the scorecards. I ended up getting caught close to the end of the third. I think they stopped the fight prematurely, but that's part of the game. Cox knew only too well that Abayabuchi had his first real acid test moment, so he called in Pickram to assist in camp. He also admitted that weren't no slip. It was a knockdown. Pickram accepted the offer and joined Cox and Ike in camp. During his time with Ike, he never picked up on any unpredictable behaviour and he said, when I went up to training camp with him, he seemed like a very normal, kind of nice guy. I don't know what happened in his life and situation. You can never tell 
when a man finds himself in a corner, what he'll do. Two months later in Austin, Abeyabuchi went 8 0 with five knockouts when he got rid of Calvin Lampkin for a second time in two rounds. By April 1996, Ike split from Boxing Management Incorporated and he signed with New York based South African promoter Cedric Kushner. It was through Cokes that Ike was introduced to established manager Bob Spagnola and an experienced matchmaker for Kushner, Bill Benton. All three men would play key roles in the rest of Ike Bayabuchi's professional career. Spagnola stated that Curtis was a dear friend, a beautiful person. He called me and said, I've got this kid who's special. Some other guys had backed Ike initially, but got a load of his craziness and bowed out gracefully. I think maybe they'd had an argument or something. Now, Curtis was an old school guy. He didn't sing many praises, so when he told me about Ike and how good he was, I believed him. I did a lot of work with Cedric. I was quite close to him at the time. I gave the kid to him. No signing bonus, no long negotiation. I just wanted to give Ike a chance. Benton and Abeyabuchi went on to have the closest relationship from the beginning and they just clicked and he said he was quite a fighter. I soon got to know what kind of a guy he really was and I was very impressed with him. So Cokes was keen for the world to see this, uh, he, he, well, his new devastating heavyweight and Kushner was the perfect promoter. He ran a show, some of us may remember back in the 90s, called The Heavyweight Explosion, live from New York and had it and it had it staged monthly at Manhattan's uh, Hammerstein Ballroom. The show was broadcast in the United States and overseas, but initially the shows were poor due to the weak talent on show. And it actually looked like the plug would be pulled. Sky TV, who were airing it over in the UK, they threatened to cancel until Benton stepped in to save the day. And he explained, I told Cedric, you're putting on some bullshit here. We need better fights. Once we started concentrating on heavyweight explosion, it really became something. Well, Ike joined the, a great team at the time. as was uh, Shannon Briggs, uh, Hassi Rockman, David Chua, Chris Bird, and Corey Sanders. And the show became distinguished. Kushner, well, if you didn't know Kushner, he was a very flamboyant bu- businessman who was originally into rock and roll business. In the rock and roll, he's promoting concerts for Fleetwood Mac, Kiss, Queen and the Rolling Stones before becoming a boxing promoter. To give the listeners an idea of the type of man that he was, Mike Marley, journalist for The Ring, tells a story about Cedric when he took a crew to a strip club. Now, somebody asked him, ever been here before, Ced? Ah, no, he said in his South African accent. Actually, this is my first ever visit to this fabulous and famous boys' town. At that point, four or five young ladies came rushing over to me and said, Oh, Cedric, how are you? Good to see you. Never been here before, said. What can I say? These bitches must read Ring magazine. That's an absolutely a brilliant story there uh, regarding good old, good old Cedric and his his keenness to uh, want to visit certain establishments. Uh, and certainly you got found out hook, line and sinker right there, didn't they? So oh, moving moving forward to Ike Bayabuche, and he did fight twice more, once in April and again in May. Both were in Dallas, Texas, and both ended with first round knockouts before his first fight under Kushner on August the 8th, 1996, when he stopped Herman Delgado in four rounds at the Civic Center in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Two months later, an Ike was pitted against Anthony Wade, 22-4, and four, at Arizona's Charlie's, a hotel and casino 15 minutes away from the Las Vegas Strip. It was the first time Ike had gone eight rounds, and he won every single round against a very durable opponent. Spagnola remembered, Wade was a Midwestern punching bag, Ike got a decision win. It was not an incredible performance, but I already knew how good he was. To conclude the year, Ike won his 13th fight in a three-round knockout of Rodney Blount in Tulsa. Then on January the 9th, 1997, at the glamorous Beverly Wiltshire Hotel in Los Angeles, he battered Calvin Jones around the ring for two rounds. The fight was not memorable, but one thing that Spagnola recalled was that Abeyabuchi brought a special guest with him, and he said, Ike brought his girlfriend along. 
She was a very beautiful southern girl from his church. She had a teenage boy from a previous relationship who was evidently very much afraid of Ike. He had two more fights in 1997 and won them both against Marion Wilson and Marcus Gonzalez and was now 16-0 with 10 knockouts. The Wilson fight was for the first time Ike had gone the 10 round distance but he came through it before knocking out Gonzalez in four rounds. Ike was now becoming impatient with his slow rise although many within his team understood his potential but Kushner was not yet convinced. Sometimes Ike would phone up Kushner and demand bigger fights. Apparently, when he did, Kushner would yell, Get this fucking African off the phone. (laughs) 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 Ah, shit. (laughs) Ah, Cedric Kushner, mate. I can just imagine his South African accent as well. Brilliant. Well, Lou De Bella, uh, we, um, you know, boxing fans. Uh, some some people may listen to this that are not necessarily boxing fans. You might just like the crime. Uh, but Lou De Bella, well, he was uh, HBO Sports Senior Vice President at the time. And he came onto the scene during one of Ike's routine victories. And he also recalled that Kushner had to be convinced about Iabuchi. He said, the first time I saw Ike fight, it was against a complete stooge on the heavyweight explosion card. Cedric wanted me to watch someone else, but Iabuchi was the guy who jumped out at me. De Bella was also once quoted as saying this of Ike. He said, he went into the ring like a ball with steam coming out of his nostrils. It was vintage 1985, 1986, 1987 Mike Tyson. He was the best heavyweight prospect I'd ever seen. He had a world of ferocity. He had hand speed. He had a chin. He had everything, but he didn't have himself. (laughs) He was never mentally sound. In the end, Ike got his biggest fight by default. When according to Spagnola, he actually bumped into Lou Duva and Debella, who asked him to consider serving up his fighter, a guy called Alonzo Highsmith. Uh, to, to their heavyweight prospect at the time, who was David Chua, 27-0. and 0. This was the short and stocky Samoan-born fighter that knocked out 23 opponents, 11 of them in the first round, including John Ruiz in just 19 seconds, and Oleg Maskiev. Not surprisingly, main events were having trouble finding Chua an opponent. So they approached Bagnola, but he rejected their suggestion of fighting Highsmith and instead offered them Ike. I've got a guy for you, Ike Iabuchi, 16 and 0. Duvi said, no one's ever heard of him. I said, they will if he, if he gets the fight. Later, Lou's son, Dino Duva, told me, don't ever mention that Iabuchi guy to my father again. I said, sorry, I was just trying to help. And a few weeks later, Ike got the fight because they literally couldn't find anyone else. The fight was set for Saturday, June 7th, 1997 in the Arco Arena in Sacramento, California and the media interest was very minimal to say the least. But Ike was enjoying his underdog status going into the bout and he said pre-fight, I have to thank Chua for taking a risk against me. I think of Muhammad Ali and look at Chua as someone with a Sonny Liston reputation. We can both punch but I can also adapt and box. Kevin Barry was Chua's manager at the time and he countered back at Ike's confidence, saying that Abea Bucci will find out that no one will ever hit him as hard as David will. Years later, Barry admitted that he found Abea Bucci unnerving and he said he seemed a little strange. He had maybe 10 guys in African attire who turned up with him. They were singing and very jovial, but Ike was very serious. He didn't come across as a nice or pleasant guy. His attitude was very much, this is serious stuff, we're going to war. He didn't smile and shake your hand. He was totally intense. And that intensity made him a little scary. The Abea Bucci Chua fight is nothing short of an absolute barnstormer. If you guys listening have not seen this fight, please go back and watch it. HBO commentator Larry Merchant referred to it as one of the best heavyweight fights of the modern times. Jim Lampley said, The only other heavyweight fight I have ever covered that I would put on an equal level for the sheer mayhem and activity was Holyfield Bow 1. And that's acknowledged as one of the greatest heavyweight championship fights of the last 30 or 40 years. Abayabuchi Chua was right up there with it.
well in this pulsating 12 round fight that is more than just the CompuBox stats record suggest but it is a good way of demonstrating of just how fast paced and ferocious this fight was Ibayabuchi landed 332 of his 975 punches setting an individual record of punches thrown by a heavyweight and Chua landed 282 of his 755 punches Combined, they threw 1,730 punches, a compu box record for punches thrown in a heavyweight fight, which has only recently been surpassed by Adam Kunaki and Chris Ariola in 2019, when they threw a total of 2,172 punches. Now, the compu box owner, Bob Canobio, explains the difference between the two fights best when he said, I was at both fights and the punches thrown and landed by Chua and Ibiabuchi were much more punishing than those landed by Koneki and Ariola. The exchanges between Ibiabuchi and Chua were just so intense. Well, the fight was close, but Ike Ibiabuchi got the decision by unanimous decision when, he, when the scores came in at 116 to 113, 115 to 114, and 117 to 111. Now, HBO's unofficial judge, as always, uh, Harold Lederman, scored the fight 115-113 for Chua. And uh, Michael Katz of the New York Daily News scored the fight draw, which some people believe it probably was. I think I probably just deserved it. And it'd be a Bucci, Well, he uh, the reported... Uh, 47,500, Chua, 75,000, obviously being the bigger name at the time. But Luke G. Williams, he broke it on per punch. He said, actually, he worked it out as each man. So Ike got $27.50 for per punch, and Chua got $43.35. <laughs> it's just wow. a great way of breaking that down. Excellent work again there, Luke. Uh, but after the fight, HBO's Larry Merchant asked him, what won this fight for you? Well, Ibaibuchi, well, um, this is what he said. He said, God, God first, I told you what has been hidden from the wise and the prudent has been revealed to the babies and the sucklings. I did not come to fight flesh and blood here, but spiritual wickedness in high and low places. To demonstrate his affection towards his religious beliefs, which he always believed in God, as well as other things, which we'll go into in a little while. His slogan, God first, always embroidered on the waistband of his trunks and on his robe in several of his profiles. If you do go back and have a look, go and have a look at his fight and you see God first printed across those shorts. Ike then went on to tell Larry Merchant, my promoter was trying to keep me a secret. Well, I don't think there are too many secrets about me now. This was my toughest fight. I did it all tonight. I boxed and I slugged. Days after his sensational victory, Ike was all over the television in numerous interviews. He even appeared on Good Morning Texas and he was beginning to get carried away with himself, calling out all the big names. And he said, if Cedric pushes me towards Evander Holyfield, I will take the fight. If he pushes me towards Mike Tyson, I will take it. I'm not scared of anyone. If I fight Evander Holyfield, my brother in Christ, I am not scared. Chua hit me with some good shots. But ring generalship did it, and God was on my side. Curtis Coax made his intentions clear that Ike was no way ready for the biggest names in boxing, and he told the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, We're not ready for Tyson or Evander just yet. We won't fight any of the big boys right now. We're going to keep on fighting guys who are trying to make their way up the ladder, just like us. He needs about six or seven more fights. The big boys can call all they want right now, but we're not going to take it. Coates' rally cry had worked when he and Ike seemed to be singing from the same hymn sheet. Ike said, Curtis told me before the fight that my life would change afterward and that I would no longer be a secret. We had a plan and we stuck to it. I just had to bide my time and be ready whenever the opportunity arrived. I proved that I can take a punch and I won't back down from anyone. I try to deliver as much punishment as I take. I'm still learning all the time and developing certain skills but I can see all of the hard work paying off. In a profile with Robert Mladenic for The Ring, uh, Ibayabuchi expanded on his ambitions. He said, I am 
on a mission to become heavyweight champion of the world. Let's see someone stand up to the president. It's time for me to step up now. It doesn't matter who I fight. I can box or brawl. Do whatever I have to do to win. The spirit of God is with me throughout all my fights. Coax would actually later tell Eric Raskin of The Ring magazine as well that Ike's ego became uncontrollable after he beat David Chua. And Coax said after the Chua fight, Ike changed complete, completely. Maybe he got hit too much in that fight and that's why he hasn't been the same. Since then, Ike's been thinking he can do whatever he wants. His biggest problem is that he just doesn't obey the rules. He wants to break the law. It's interesting that Cokes mentioned that maybe he got hit too much because it's been rumoured. This, is, this has been mentioned a few times after the fight. The Bayabuchi complained of terrible headaches. So he's actually taken to the hospital and underwent several observations, including an MRI. But nothing abnormal was found. Nothing abnormal physically in a way, but mentally you have to question the men that surrounded him because Ike believed that his headaches did not come from the fight against Chua or any other fight for that matter. He left the hospital that day believing that his headaches must be because I am possessed by evil spirits. <laughs> now, <laughs> Now, if the alarm bells were not ringing by this point, he then began to believe that he was really, really now the president. Exactly what Richard Lord had mentioned earlier in this episode. But this time, it was much more evident in his persona. And Lou DeBella said there were times when he thought he was really the president. He would get into these mental states where he insisted insisted on people calling him the president. It was his alter ego, where I am the president, not of the United States, but maybe president of the world. <laughs> it's quite evident, isn't it, that he's uh, definitely got maybe maybe even a bit of CTE after that Chira fight. Maybe. We'll, yeah. just, we'll just never know, even though they didn't find anything physically. I mean... Maybe it's not CTE, but it's definitely affected him mentally, hasn't it? You know, like at this point in time, he's he's referring to himself in the third person. He's calling himself the president. He genuinely believes that he's possessed by demons after this. I mean, what else is he going to come out with next? What else is going to happen next? Sure, <laughs> mate. <laughs> go on, you go on, mate. Go on, go on, go on. Uh, no, just the next one that comes up. It, it, it develops uh, beyond unbelievably scary. My goodness. Well, in fact further things were going to take uh, an even weirder turn because Ike's strange demeanour took a scary turn one night when he was having dinner in New York with his promoter, Cedric Kushner and Lou DiBella, who explains what happened in his own words and Lou said, We hadn't even got into serious conversation. It was just chit-chat, pleasantries, and I asked him, Where do you live, Ike? He looked at me and said, Why do you want to know where I live? Why are people concerned with where I live? Is someone looking for me? Why do you want to know where I live? And after that little expression of dismay, he plunged the steak knife into the table. DiBella recalled, I can deal with anybody, and I don't get scared easily. I've seen everything in 30 years of boxing, but I never saw anyone plunge a steak knife into a table in front of me before Ike Bayabuchi did. Kushner admitted that his fighter's behaviour wasn't the type of conduct I expected to romance the guy from HBO. Eric Botcher, a former matchmaker for Kushner, insisted, I've been around boxing a long time, long enough to realise that it's not a normal profession, and a lot of boxers are not normal human beings. But Ike is the only fighter I've ever met who I would literally say, who I would say was literally insane. Now, Lou DiBella said that maybe the sudden fame and attention help to destabilise an already unstable individual. And he said, going from having nothing before the Chua fight to all of a sudden having some money to spend, I think that may have been a part of it. He continued with his assessment by saying, it wasn't shocking to me that Ike disappeared at times, that Ike wasn't training properly, that Ike was womanising, 
that Ike was seeing evil spirits. Nothing was shocking to me. I knew Ike had issues, although I didn't know that he was mentally ill per se in the beginning. I didn't know if he was just a guy who was ill-disciplined. But he was never a clean-living, wonderful, trusting, stable person. Ike always had issues, but they got progressively worse. He had issues with his girlfriend and his girlfriend's son. He seemed to have issues with women. He just seemed to have issues. Jesus Christ, the steak knife. But by the sounds of it, that, just go back to that steak knife. It was just like a nice, peaceful restaurant. You know, it worked like a bar. It's like a nice, quiet restaurant. And he goes and plunges the steak knife into the middle of the table. I mean, well, for that point, you'd be like, see you later, mate. Um, I think we're done with this guy. But <laughs> no, they didn't. Yeah, they see the money signs. It don't matter how mental you are. Um, well, those issues, as uh, the Bella mentioned, they escalated less than three months after the David Chua fight when Ike Ibayabuchi got arrested on August 26, 1997. He drove his car straight into a concrete pillar on the embankment of a bridge on Interstate 35. Now, this is a highway that runs from Laredo near New near US and Mexico borders. With him in the vehicle was the 15-year-old son of his now estranged girlfriend. When the wreckage was cleared and the human damage assessed, Ike emerged amazingly unscathed, but his teenage passenger had a broken pelvis and jaw, as well as a diagnosis that he might never walk properly again. Once arrested and thrown into prison, his bail for two alleged offences of aggravated kidnapping and attempted murder was half a million dollars. What motivated him to crash his car remains a subject of speculation. Some believe he suffered a bipolar episode. Others say he had a paranoid schizophrenia episode. And some claimed that he was just in a rage and wasn't happy with the position of his latest BC heavyweight rankings. Well, Bob Spagnola recalled a summer of absolute chaos vividly, and he claimed that Ibuchi's actions sprung from the collapse of his relationship with his girlfriend. And he said, I fell out of his girlfriend. She had had enough. So he grabbed her kid and took off in a car. It was a four-cylinder rent-a-car, and he turned into the embankment of a bridge. He must have been going about 80 miles an hour because he left Dallas at like two o'clock and at three, he caused his wreck 80 miles away uh, down the highway near Waco. He was in a rage. When asked if he, if Ike's girlfriend had split up with him directly before the incident, Spagnola said, not according to Ike, but according to her, yes. So, you know, Ike is just, he's gone, he's completely gone. That's, that's all you can really say. Uh, and he continues, he said, this was at the top of his fame, but she still had the gumption to stand up to him. So he went for a way to hurt her the most, which was through the child. There was no explanation for Ike not being killed other than that being a physical monster he was. Plus, he was behind a steering column where you get a bit more protection. I'm convinced Ike tried to kill himself. He wasn't trying to hurt the child and not himself. Well, uh, there's some serious problems right there. Ike called Bob Spagnola by phone as he sat in the Williamson County Jail and he said, You must not care about me. This is a terrible place. How can you allow me to be in such a terrible place? You must not care about me very much to have me in such a place. Spagnola recalled him calling me dozens of times from jail. Those calls... Uh, riveted in my mind. The county jail is not a place you ever want to visit. For that monster of a man to be terrified, well, you can imagine what might happen to lesser people in a situation like that. It ain't no fucking fun under any circumstances. Author again, Luke Williams, wrote, the boy alleged that Abayabuchi had initially told him they were going on a journey, but after leaving Dallas County, he decided he no longer wanted to be in the car. When he had tried to get out, he said Abayabuchi struck him in the face. Ike then continued driving before he smashed the car straight into the concrete pillar. Now, police arrested Abayabuchi on August 26th and he began to call all his contacts in hope that they could help him. 
He apparently called Cedric Kushner many times, which was confirmed by Eric Boccia, but all these calls were screened. Spagnola and Boccia both agreed that Ike should not be bailed out because it was immoral and because he wasn't demonstrating that he thought he did anything wrong. However, in September, with bail requirements dropped from $250,000 per count to $50,000, Abayabuchi posted bail. A Williamson County grand jury then reduced his attempted murder charge to aggravated assault and aggravated kidnapping, with court papers noting that he used the car as a deadly weapon. His lawyers began to negotiate an outcome that would help him resume his career again, and Ike was convinced that he would indeed be back in the ring soon, telling The Ring in an interview in November of 1997 that he was on a mission from God. Boxing is just part of my mission. Well, not long after, Ike was arrested again for violating the terms of his bail and sent to prison before being bailed out again in mid-December. The case was finally resolved in the first week of April 1998 when Ike Ibiabuchi pleaded guilty to false imprisonment and Judge John Carter sentenced him 120 days in prison. Incredible. Williamson County District Attorney Ken Anderson admitted the aggravated assault and kidnapping charges weren't supported by strong enough evidence. He stated the main issue of the case was whether or not he and Mike Ibiabuchi was trying to injure man. Our final conclusion was that he was severely depressed and was trying to commit suicide. I mean, it's crazy. It just, just ignore the fact there's a child in the car. It doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Williamson County Prosecutor John Bradley spoke to ESPN, expressed his dissatisfaction of the case, and he said it was a very frustrating case. We weren't able to get him examined, uh, but it sure seemed to me, even if he was a heavyweight boxer look, making, looking at making millions of dollars, that he should have been committed to a psychiatric facility and treated. And uh, I agree with Bob Bradley right there. Even more worryingly, the court papers actually noted that Ibiabuchi appeared to be competent with prison captain Bob Webster saying that everyone was real scared, real scared of him at first, but he was a uh, real quiet and a nice guy. One of Ibiabuchi's team told columnist Graham Houston, if we hadn't been able to show he was off his rocker, he would have been facing very serious charges. Court papers didn't detail the terms of any settlement with the victim, although later unconfirmed reports claimed that he was paid half a million dollars, while Spagnola recalled part of the arrangement was that the teenager would get a percentage of Ike's earnings going forward. Following his release, his mother gets on the scene, Patricia, and uh, his mother... Oh, she, all I'm saying is the apple don't far, fall too far from the tree. His mother, Patricia, promised the court and told officials that her son would be moving with her to Phoenix, Arizona, and he would be seeking treatment for depression. But he wasn't the only one who needed treatment. Bob Spagnola explains more on this, and he said, we moved Ike out to Phoenix with his mum. I was told that where they were living, there was aluminium foil, Reynolds wrap, as some people call it, over the windows, to keep out the heat because it's like 120 degrees in the day there. But Ike's mum also said she had that stuff up to keep the evil spirits out. And this was their place of solace where the mum was going to make sure everything was alright. That's when we realised we were fucked. And Spagnola wasn't the only one who realised that his mother was as crazy if not crazier than Ike was. Michael Marley formed his opinion based on frequent conversations with Kushner and he said Abayabuchi believed what his mother believed, namely that the federal government was tracking his thoughts and listening to his phone calls and had taken over his and his mother's minds. Kushner would laugh, but what else could he do? He said he would make a decent fight offer to Abayabuchi and Ike would say he had to consult with his mother. Cedric would get phone calls from the mother in the wee hours of the morning saying that the FBI was tapping her phone, that something had been put in her dental work, that they were monitoring her every thought. The stories seemed quite funny back then, but they don't seem funny now. A new manager came into the team. Although Bob Spagnola was still involved in some capacity, but a Houston attorney and political operator, Steve Monisteri, was brought in. 
he would later become chairman of the Republican Party of Texas and serve in the Trump administration as a deputy assistant to the president and deputy director for the Office of Public Liaison. Monisteri distanced himself from the Ike saga when questioned recently, saying that he was only there for a short time. He never met him in person and in his words, I was from Texas and they were looking to add somebody to the team that could help guide them in picking opponents to get him back in the rankings and a title shot. Wow, my goodness, Patricia and Ike together. Um, that sounds just crazy. And the fact that he's been after with the young boy and, and, and where do they send him? They send him to Arizona with his mum who's sticking all, all bits of fall up on the window. <laughs> Microchips and all sorts. Oh my goodness me. <laughs> Holy shit. And the fact that you know, she was getting his call, Cedro was getting, can you imagine him sitting at home, two o'clock in the morning, getting a phone call like, oh, it's, it's the Abuchis again. He knows that crazy, it's going to happen. I mean, and, and he just, oh, it's all right, I'll get you a fight, mate. I mean, the, he should be saying, I've had enough of this guy, but obviously they just, you know, they see the millions of dollars in, in, in the horizon, which is what they wanted. So his return bout was supposed to be on May 1998, just two months after the conclusion of the court case. But he had put on a lot of timber while in prison. Curtis Coke said he weighed 269 pounds, an extra 34 pounds since that David Chua fight. And that weight needed to go before he could make his return. Ike's comeback opponent was Tim Ray in Marksville, Louisiana on July 9th, 1998. And interestingly, Chuck McGregor had to step in for Cokes as a trainer. And I do wonder if Cokes was sort of coming to the end of his tether with Ike at this point. Well, before the fight, Greg Juckett, who worked for Cedric Kushner Promotions, as CKP, as it was known, said that Ike's behaviour was very strange and it was hard to determine what he would do next. For a while, he insisted that he just referred to it we just referred to him as the president. Again, he's gone back to that state of mind. He then disappeared right before the weigh-in and locked himself into the hotel room. Eric Butcher recalled Chuck McGregor called his room. I ended up hanging up on Chuck. We were very concerned he wasn't, that he wasn't going to fight. And at that point, Chuck said, I've got an idea. So we called back and asked to speak to the president. From what Chuck told me later, he said, Ike said, hold on a moment as if he was getting someone else on the line and then came back and spoke as the president. Chuck explained that there was a very important meeting and the president must be present. As that meeting couldn't be conducted until the president arrived because he was the most important person in the room. Ike then, of course, came down to the way when Tim Ray saw Ike at the weigh-in, he admitted that he was unnerved when he first saw him. They told me, that's the guy you're fighting. It was 70 or 80 degrees. He was wearing a leather cowboy duster and a cowboy hat. I thought, what's up with this? Well, the fight was abruptly ended in the first round after just two minutes and 33 seconds, making a triumphant return for Ike Ibaibuchi. His opponent was full of praise, saying Ibaibuchi should have been world champion. He hit really hard. He was a really good fire, and he even called him a really nice guy. A really nice guy who refers to himself as the president. And that's a brilliant story. <laughs> it's, it's very unnerving, very strange, very crazy. But it made me laugh that they actually had the wits about him to ring his room back and ask for the president and basically make him out to be the most important person in that building so that he would fucking turn up for the weigh-in. I mean, who has to do that? I mean, that that's ridiculous. And that just goes to show you that there's two, there's two issues here. The first issue is he's clearly mentally unstable if he's referring to himself in the third person that way. And secondly, why are they allowing this to happen in the first place if they know he's unstable like this? And it begs the question to me, why are they allowing this to happen? Absolutely crazy. And then he goes in and he turns up in a fucking cowboy hat and a, and a, and a duster. Like, you know, this this is a big guy, a big guy, a big African-American guy, and he's he's dressing like a fucking cowboy. I mean, come on. You know, this this, this is just like, he's, he's got some really strange behaviours going on here. It's well, definitely 20 degree heat as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Get out. So, two months later, Ike took on a more resilient opponent in the Jamaican-born Everton Davis in Atlantic City, New Jersey, who had gone the 10-round distance with David Chua four years earlier. This fight was all about getting Ike back in the public eye again. 
Monisteri explained their methods behind the madness and he said, the second step we chose was to get him a larger national audience against a respected opponent in Davis. Everton was a tough guy that had gone rounds with other people. We got that fight on ESPN, so that got Ike wide coverage. The fight served its purpose, with Ike getting nine rounds in the bank until he stopped Davis with a wicked body shot. Monisteri recalled that Ike performed really well. The Davis fight, well, it served the purpose of getting him some rounds and also sending a statement to the heavyweight division that he still had a big skill level. Well, if you thought everything seemed to be going quite smoothly for Ike at this point, then think again. Before the Everton Davies fight, there was a very unsettling incident involving Ike's mother Patricia, who was staying in the same room as her son. Louis Dubella was with Kushner when Patricia called the promoter, and this is his account of the story, and he said, She called Cedric, saying that evil spirits were coming in through the air conditioning system. She said that we had to do something, because they couldn't control the air conditioning. Cedric's first reaction was to tell her to turn off the air conditioning. When that didn't suffice, Cedric had to call the hotel to get them to turn off the air circulation. There was a lot of weirdness going on. Ike had a dark storyline, man. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, it was just before Christmas. So Ike decided to take a holiday to Las Vegas, staying at the Treasure Island Hotel. While in his hotel room, he ordered a prostitute. And he told Tim Graham of ESPN, I had sex with escorts many times it's no strings attached. I paid with checks and credit cards. It was a guilty pleasure. The encounter ended with Ike Beabucci being accused of sexual assault, but due to the lack of evidence, the case was closed. Oh my goodness. I mean... Spirits in the, the air conditioning? That... Oh, please, shit, man. And the fact that Cedric Kushner just accepts the call and he's like, you know, it's, it's roasting outside. They got the air, they need the aircon in that room, and he just sends some staff in to turn it off. I mean, this is where you're wondering why they're clearly in it for the money. I mean, they just they just want to just keep getting him into the ring as much as they can, to earn as much money as they can, because he has the potential to be a world champion. Irrelevant of his mental health issues, because him and his mother had some serious mental health issues. I think it's pretty darn clear. Well. Maybe this should have been investigated further. I mean, we, we absolutely should have been because Ike was quoted as saying, I feel women should bow to me. I have a great ego when going after women. I'm not a person to rape a woman because I'm of the belief that she should want to have sex with me. <laughs> if she doesn't want to be with me, I don't want to have sex with her. No, you just take it anyway. <laughs> That's basically what he said. Okay, no. It was really not very well. I mean, he was not only a danger, or a, a danger to himself. He was also a danger to the public. Yet still, CKP, CKP Cedric Kushner promotions continued to arrange many more. Fights. Well, they just wanted as many fights as they on their cash check. Really, I mean, we we did some speak some of the other day that boxers just cash machines, and uh, I think that was in Randy Turpins and. This is the absolute pinnacle of that. This was before. I mean, it, they just wanted to cash on him before he had his mental breakdown. Kushner agreed a deal for him to have a fight against the newest signing for main events, who was the undefeated and avoided, very much avoided, very, and a slickster fighter in Chris Chris Bird, who was actually 26 and 0. Now, the date for the fight was set for March 20th, 1999. It must have been difficult to keep Ike's erratic behavior under, under wraps, but they tried. Publicly, Steve Manister refused to confirm any problems. He told Graham Houston that Ike had against him no serious charges, ended up sticking just a misdemeanor. Uh, he had an incident with the law. It's resolved and we move on. <sighs> EKP were managing to keep all troubles in-house. Bob Sp Spagnolo explained that everyone knew. Ike started to act very strangely when we were training for the, the fight with, with Chris, Chris Bird. Everyone was talking about how unstable he was, although their uh, vernacular was never as gracious as to use the word unstable. Greg Juckett backed up Spagnola's assessment. He said only people within CKP knew, but we were really having trouble controlling Ike's habits at that point. I don't think 
anybody really knew why he was acting the way he was. Uh, mental health jacket. I mean, wow. <laughs> you don't know why. He needs a, psych- a psychiatrist to see him. But nobody had the audacity to say, take this guy to a psychiatrist, you know, and stop the fight and stop him from fighting altogether. That's what should have been happening. So it was inevitable trouble would arise. And it did in the form of Ike's sparring partner, Ezra Sellers. During a session, Ike's eye got cut from a jab. Nothing happened straight away, but Ike was clearly pissed off about it. He saw that Sellers was wearing a wedding ring and accused him of cutting him deliberately. Eric Boccia explained what happened and he said, it was nuts because even if Sellers had been wearing the ring while sparring, which he wasn't, they had gloves on. Anyway, Ike attacked Ezra. In the melee, Curtis was injured. From that point on, Ike did not spar any rounds for the bird fight. He often didn't even go to the gym at all, I was told later. He did road work and whatever, but that was it. Curtis didn't really have control of Ike by now. Nobody did. Everybody began to get nervous as to if Ike would even show up to the bird fight at all. So Kushner decided to call on his old friend, Bill Benton to watch him and make sure he got to the fight. Benton believes that a lot of these stories about Ike have been exaggerated. So make what you will out of this next statement from Benton himself. And he said, what you'll hear from me now is how it really happened. I was at all of Ike's fights. He wouldn't go anywhere without me. He trusted me and that meant a lot. There weren't a lot of people he really trusted. I wouldn't work his corner, but I would be there. And he would say to me, Watch the water bottle for me, will you? He wouldn't ask anybody else that. He wanted to make sure nobody would put anything in his water. He was a little scared of that. Usually when he came back to the corner, I would open up a new bottle because I knew it was something he wanted. He knew that I had his back, that I wouldn't sell him out. He also knew that I didn't bullshit. I wouldn't lie to anybody. Him and I just got along. Well, Bill did as he was instructed by Kushner and he stayed with Ike 24-7 and made sure he never got into any trouble. The trouble was, Ike never trained once. He stayed in his room, and went out at night, but not a single trip to the gym since the melee. The fight was now a few weeks away, and CKP had managed to keep the problems out of the papers, but then, like magic, Michael Katz of the New York Daily News wrote a story titled, A Bayabuchi Gives Boxing a Black Eye, which addressed the issue of A mental health. When the news went public, Kushner and Ministeri made no effort to hide Ike Ibayabuchi's issues. Kushner told Katz that, in his opinion, Ibayabuchi was a manic depressive and even spoke about the story of the demons in the air conditioning. Ministeri said that he believed that Ibayabuchi was severely depressed and speculated that during the car accident, he may have thought was he was being chased by demons. Although he had also added, to this day, Ike doesn't remember what happened. The only person who didn't throw Ike under the bus was Benton, saying there's nothing wrong mentally or physically. Graham Houston's headline for Boxing Monthly was mad, bad and dangerous to know. Ike would now be under the microscope of the public eye and the weigh-in was becoming... Highly anticipated. Kushner was now ready to cash in on his troublesome fire and nobody within the promotional team gave him a chance in in hell against Bird. Mitch Winston, another cog in the CKP, was certain that Ike would lose, so he put thousands of dollars on Bird. Benton had done well to get Ike onto the plane, but it was the connecting flight. They were flying from uh, Phoenix to Tacoma and they had a stop off at Salt Lake City International Airport. And that's when things got difficult. Spagnola recalled this. He said, then Ike decided it was just Bill and Ike there. No, Bill, I'm not getting on any more planes. The spirits have told me I can't get on another plane. Benton said we were about halfway and had a connecting flight when Ike said, my spirits tell me not to get on this plane. We missed two connecting flights and we're just sitting at the airport. I mean, this is madness. This guy is saying he's got spirits in his head. I mean, how mad would that be if he was a passenger? You see this big guy getting on a fucking plane. 
talking about spirits. Oh, shit. Eventually, Bill Benton convinced him and they uh, finally did get on the board the plane and they arrived at Tacoma. Mitch Winston remembers seeing Ike arrive with Benton at the Emerald Hotel Casino. And he said Ike was shirtless with a toothpick in his mouth, wearing jeans and a jean kit, a black cowboy hat, dark sunglasses and cowboy boots. He was pissed at the world, intense and unsmiling. He also went on to say that he looked ripped, physically reminded him of Clubber Lang from Rocky Free. <laughs> and so he was shirtless with a toothpick in his mouth, wearing jeans and a jean jacket, black cowboy hat, dark sunglasses, cowboy boots. Man, he's just, he loves this Western theme, doesn't he? I can't be up I mean, what, what's, what's going on? He's, he's got this, he seems to have this bit of a fantasy yeah. about it. But the fact that he's, he's not getting on a plane, he's being, he's telling people, oh, well, I've got spirits, the spirits are telling me not to get on this plane. It's like, fucking hell, if that doesn't automatically diagnose him as mentally unstable, I do not know what will, because clearly there is something not right, and yet Benton, Benton is still adamant at this point, yeah, there's nothing wrong with him, he's fine. Stuff. I mean, was he on the same stuff? Was he drinking from the same Kool-Aid? Because how the hell could you not see that? I mean, we don't know Ike Bayabuchi in person, we don't know him, know him to speak to, do you know? And, and we can tell from all the accounts that there's something really not right, but yet they all just carried on trying to brush everything under the, under the rug. Now, many, many feared Ike's crazy behaviour. He was marching around the hotel like a soldier. Even his opponent, Chris Bird, noted his military-style spectacle and said, when we got to the hotel, he, as in Abayabuchi, was outside looking at the sky, walking back and forth. My father looked at me and said, you're fighting a crazy man. There's something wrong with him. He's just out there, walking up and down, looking at the sky. My whole team, my wife, everybody, we were like, that's very strange. I continue with his strange conduct at the fighters meeting with HBO, and this is what Eric Bocci remembered, and he said, Ike's behaviour was very odd. Larry Merchant and Jim Lampley was there, I was there, Ike walked in wearing sunglasses and a cowboy hat and sat down. The first question was, Ike, we understand you were cut during training, we wanted to know, did this affect your preparation in any way? Ike said nothing and just sat there for, I don't know, 10 seconds. It may not sound like a long time, but when you're in a room full of people waiting for an answer, it's an eternity. Finally, in a very lispy, high-pitched voice, he said, What cut? That pretty much ended the interview. They normally last 30 minutes or so. I was checking the time, and after only about 13 minutes, Jim politely ended it. When Ike left, Jim looked at me and said, That man's crazy which he was. On fight night, while in his dressing room, Ike told his team he would be staying put unless he was brought a Snickers bar. And again, Eric Boccia explains all about what happened and he said, I didn't see the incident, but I was told later that Ike refused to go in the ring until he had a Snickers. I understand that Steve Monisteri had to go and find a Snickers and then everyone had to wait for Ike to eat it. With the nuts still in his teeth and demands circling around his head, Ike proved his doubters wrong yet again and produced the goods in devastating fashion. Uh, it's terrible because this guy's mentally unstable. He's not well and I'll just find myself pissed myself with laughter. Like the fact that he's demanding the Snickers, you know, well, sitting was, in that ball rating. It reminds, it reminds me of the advert that they put on the uh, UK telly. If, <laughs> if any of you guys have, have not seen the UK Don't advert you. where, where the, the, there's an angry man in, in, in a football changing room and he's shouting and he's bawling and he's going on one and all of a sudden he gets given a Snickers and they basically say to him, are you better? And he goes, yeah, I'm better. I can just imagine Ike Abayabuchi doing the same thing. He must have been the inspiration <laughs> for them adverts. Oh, mate. Get, yeah, get out Dave for a Snickers. Oh, my <laughs> goodness, mate. Steve Tukati described the action in the Seattle Times. The 1992 Olympic silver medalist hid for nearly five rounds of their heavyweight before the Bayabuchi found him. And when that happened, the scheduled 10-round bout was quickly over. Bayabuchi delivered a pair of wicked uppercuts late in the fifth round, sending Bird to the canvas twice and prompting referee Ron Rawl to stop the fight before a sellout crowd at the Emerald Queen Casino. He then went on to write, 
in a fight featuring two top heavyweight prospects looking for a title shot. It, it was Ibai Bucci who would be challenging Lennox Lewis or about Holyfield for the end of the year for a championship belt, if he only knew the issues he was going through at the time. After the victory, Ike Ibai Bucci said, I'm ready to go on. I'll keep training and get my chance. Curtis Cox was happy that Ike had listened and taken his instructions, even though he never stepped foot in a gym for weeks. He told Houston he stayed under control. He went to Nigeria a couple of times with a right hand, but he stayed in America. Stayed to the body. Kill the body and the head dies. Bird made no excuses. He's a big guy and I need to get out of the way. He got me on the ropes and I didn't get off me with a... And it was a haunting punch for Ron Scott Stevens, the former New York State Athletic Commission chairman. He said... I've very rarely seen a guy hit as hard as Bird got hit that with that punch. You could hear the punch from across the arena. I was right there at ringside and I've almost never heard a punch land like that one. Referee Ron Rule was even closer to the action. He would have, you can hear it as well on YouTube and he made no bones about his decision when he, when he decided to stop the fight. He said, I saved his life. One more punch could have killed him. It certainly could have done. Uh, I, Brutal, brutal knockout. Now, yep. Bird's attorney and advisor, John John Hornewer, would later say, once he, as in Abayabuchi, saw the cut, it was like he smelled blood. Then he was coming in like an animal for the kill. This guy is Sonny Liston, reincarnated. Jim Lampley was impressed with Ike that night, and he said, it was explosive, it was impressive, it was an electric shock of energy into the heavyweight division. After the impressive win, Ike's promotional team began to dream of having a future world heavyweight champion on their hands. Monisteri declared in the press conference that Abayabuchi was the best heavyweight in the world, and we believe he should be the number one contender with all three organisations. Now Kushner told Graham Houston Ike belongs with the top heavyweights in the world. Kushner went on to say, I'd just like to get him a little more active. And that's exactly what he tried to do. Ike was penciled in for a fight on Saturday, June 19th, 1999 for a major HBO show at Madison Square Garden, scheduled to be headlined by rising heavyweight Michael Grant. Ike wasn't happy with the $300,000 he received for the Birdwin, and he was even more enraged by the offer to face a beatable Jeremy Williams on the undercard of Grant's fight against Lou Savarese, turning down a career-best half a million dollars. Considering that Grant's purse was $950,000 and he had a poorer resume compared to Ike's and Savarese got just over a million, you can kind of understand his reluctance and why he would want to request more money. Kushner, though, was pissed, but just so he could get Ike back into the ring, he offered to waive his own cut, which increased Ike's purse to $700,000, yet Ike still refused. So in an unorthodox way, Kushner asked Larry Merchant to try and talk some sense into a senseless Abayabuchi and Merchant said, It was the only time in my career I've done anything like this, but I volunteered to talk to Abayabuchi and tell him how important a stage this would be and how it would lead to the biggest things. I told him he would steal the spotlight from the main event. We had a long discussion and periodically, every two or three minutes he would say, I want $5 million to fight Lennox Lewis. Or maybe it was 10. Well, Larry Merchant continued. He said it was clear that Ibayabuchi had never become fully accultured into American life or Western life. He didn't trust the system. He thought the wins over Tua and, and Bird qualified him for a shot at a title for a lot more money. And in the abstract, maybe they did. Fighters have gotten championship fights with less qualifications. But in this situation where Ibayabuchi was perceived as a serious threat who could beat anyone, including Lewis, he had to build his brand, his image, in the public's eye to secure that fight. I kept trying to explain how the American system worked, but it was pretty clear to me that Ibayabuchi didn't quite get it. He just kept repeating that mantra, I want five million to fight Lennox Lewis. After all that effort, HBO decided not to waste any more time on Ike and match Williams with Maurice Harris instead. And Ike lost out on a very, very good opportunity. Even if he had have accepted the offer, he probably wouldn't have made it to the ring 
anyway, because a week before the scheduled fight on June 12, Ike was at Dallas Fort Worth International Airport when he was arrested on suspicion of disorderly conduct, resisting arrest and criminal mischief. The incident involved an altercation at the check-in desk. Bob Spagnola claimed Ibucci got irritated because the check-in attendant mispronounced his name and got it wrong or something. Good job, I went on to check out. <laughs> he was further angered when he was told that he couldn't board his flight because he was overbooked. I declared, you know what? I'm going on an airplane anyway. You have to stop me. Threatened to be arrested, he ran until he was finally stopped by the authorities and told to put his hands behind his back. But he refused. He was threatened with pepper spray. And he said, you better shoot me. They pepper sprayed him in the face twice. And he was wrestled to the floor by two officers who left him and bundled him into the patrol car. Ike was not going down without a fight. And while in the car, he kicked out a car door window. Oh, oh my God. He just gets some bad to worse from him, like... Everything just seems to be pissing him off so badly at the moment, and he's just reacting to everything. And he's telling the police, "You know, just shoot me, just shoot me. It's fine, shoot me." So they did. Fucking pepper sprayed him in the face twice, and they had to get him down, get him in the bastard car, and he's still kicking and screaming while he's going in there, isn't it? Absolutely crazy. Now somehow Ike managed to get himself out of his most recent troubles and found himself on ESPN's Friday Fight Night, sitting ringside at the Grand Savarese bout. He even had an interview with KO Magazine's Joe Santaliquito where Ike compared himself with his late father and this is what he said. We're both strong, mentally and physically. I think he's a bit wrong there. My dad was just like me growing up. He boxed a little, but he was a showman. He did the circus strongman things like lifting stuff. That's not where I get my gift from. This thing here is more natural. What I have is more mental. Santo Liquito added his opinion on Ike's character and he said, Ike is a very likeable guy with an engaging smile. It's almost enough to make you wonder whether or not some of the negative things involving him really happened. He also asked Ike about the 1997 car crash and this was Ike's response. I'm not going to cover up what happened. It's just something in outside life that I was not used to. It was a learning process. I had an accident and I took care of it. He continued by saying, I didn't want to get into a motor vehicle accident, but I was depressed. It happens to every good fighter. I'm no different. It's something that is past, and I have moved on with my life. Santo Liquito did not avoid any difficult questions, and he told him, Some people think you're crazy. His response, however, was very interesting, and Ike said, It hurts me very much what people think about me. People will call me anything. They will say I'm crazy. They will say I'm nothing. What matters is if you are willing to accept those names they call you. If I was crazy, I'm crazy enough to understand that I need to make a living. If that's how craziness is defined, I like that craziness. I like it a lot. I'm not crazy. I just want people to understand that Ike is in a learning process and there's no way you could judge him and what he's doing. If people don't give me credit, I have to give myself credit. I know what I've accomplished. I know I'm not crazy. If they say I'm crazy, they're probably envious of what I've accomplished. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much the the sum, <laughs> the sum of it, really. I think he's talking yeah, about himself. Shit. He's talking about himself in the third person again. He's he's referring to himself as a completely different character. There's definitely, definitely a lot of shades right there in that interview that he's got bipolar disorder you know he's talking about a different character like a persona that persona as we know to be the president it gets more worse than this following grant's victory over Cervais, ministry agreed that ike abuchi would be taking the grant fight for three million dollars and it was even rumored to be taking place on november 6th at madison square garden trouble was his contract with ckp was running out and a certain don king was sniffing around for his signature. At the end of July in 1999, Ike decided to make a trip to Las Vegas. Nobody knows why for sure, as to why, maybe because he woke up with more prostitutes, or maybe, as some have suggested, 
he was due to meet Don King, who had apparently paid for his stay at the Mirage Hotel. Whatever the reason, Ike's life would take the most dramatic turn, to say the least. In the early hours of Thursday, July 26th, Ike calls for an escort. But when the woman arrives, she's a stripper and not a lady of the night. Ike isn't happy because, well, he wants sex. The woman then alleges that they got into a heated argument, which then turned into a scuffle. Scared out of her wits, she runs into the walk-in wardrobe to escape the clutches of Ike. But he grabs her, pulls her pants off, and tries to sexually assault her. A district attorney, Christopher Lally, explains what he believes happened. He invites her up to his room and begins to get physical with her. It got loud enough that people in the adjoining room notified hotel security. When they enter the room, a woman naked from the waist down is running towards them. The police, led by Metro Police Lieutenant Tom Monaghan, arrived on the scene at 5.30 a.m. And he said that the 21-year-old woman entertainer on call claimed that Ibai Bucci had sexually assaulted her. Ike then refuses to come out of his room and he decides to barricade himself in the bathroom. So, to get him out, police discharge pepper spray under the door, and they successfully lure him out. He is, of course, arrested with the initial bail set at $5 million, but is then reduced a week later to $2 million, but with no money to pay the bail, he was sent to the Clark County Detention Centre. Wow, it's just not good at all. And due to a history of sexual assaults in Las Vegas, the Clark County DAs reopened the allegation from eight months earlier that took place next door to the Mirage at the sister property Treasure Island Hotel and Casino. And court records later detailed what I. Bayabuchi was accused of. And he said, on July 22nd, 1999, Akemfula Charles Abayabuchi forcibly detained, battered and digitally penetrated both the vagina and anus of the victim. While in police custody, according to Benton, Ike continued to act irrationally and managed to build a reputation within the detention centre. And he said, another boxer at jail told me, Bill, sooner or later... Every bad motherfucker in the world comes here. We get the baddest of the bad. They all land in our jail. And you know what? Ike Bayabucci is absolutely the baddest guy we've ever had. That reputation was further reinforced when Ike picked up an additional charge of assaulting a prison officer after an incident on August the 8th. The Deputy District Attorney, Mary K. Holtus, said, even in a controlled setting, we can't control him. (laughs) The, The judge responded by raising his bail to three million but the assault charge never made it to court. With news breaking across all media outlets, Kushner spoke to the Austin American statesman and said, This is America. Ike is entitled to his day in court. Do I want to have dinner with Ike three nights a week? No. Do I think he's one of the best heavyweights in the world? Yes. I'm not in the business where good conduct is guaranteed. It really doesn't matter that my fighter is not the nicest guy or that I might not want him to go out with my youngest sister. What a scumbag. (laughs) Ron Ron Borges, writing in the Boston Globe, shamed his handlers and said, Have you seen any of the apologists and friends of Obayabuchi lately? Now that he needs two million in bail money to get himself out of a Las Vegas jail? Borges asked, The guys who were pushing him into a boxing ring when he needed to be really pushed into a psychiatrist's office, don't seem to be as helpful or as concerned about him now. Well, by September, I pleaded not guilty and the trial date was set for December 6th, 1999. Alongside him was Richard Wright, a highly rated defence attorney, and Tony Amengo, a New York-based attorney of Nigerian heritage. Now, Bob Araman is the scene, and he actually offered and legal support to support him getting out on bail and have that reduced. And ESPN reported that Aram actually offered between $150,000 and $175,000 to post bail. The state deemed Ike to be a flight risk, a danger to the community in general and to women specifically, but bail was still granted and he was released on a 750000 bail bond. Aram declined to pay that much, but someone else did. And Ike left prison on November 24, 
1999 under house arrest in Las Vegas area and forced to wear an electric tag. His passport was confiscated and, of course, he was told that he was not allowed to call in any more escorts. Well, that's pretty darn true. I mean, that's just like, what the fuck? Uh, the trial date was then moved to February 22nd, 2000, when the Wright argued that he needed more time to prepare for Ibaibuchi's defence. With all this hanging over him, Ike still met with Bob Arum to discuss a contract. And by the promoter's statement, it would seem it went a very similar way to when he had his meeting with Larry Merchant. And Aram said, I told him all the things I could do for him, but he didn't seem to grasp any of it. The way I look at it now, I'm not going to put good money after bad. I think I cut my losses. On January 31st, two other female escort workers from Arizona testified that Ike had sexually assaulted them and held them against their will. And so he was arrested once again. Ike was eventually deemed incompetent to stand trial after a rambling statement in court. He said the current situation was killing him. And could he not just pay a fine and leave? <laughs> no, Ike, you can't, mate, unfortunately. His mother, well, Patricia, she, she chimes in, claiming that her son had an accident. I'm guessing she was referring to the accident. He had a car accident. And he had been sent to a mental hospital where she and he believed he had been implanted with microchips in oh his body. God. She said that Ike had under, undergone an MRI scan in the hospital and had not been the same since. Oh, my God. It's bad enough of what he's saying, but then for his mum to come along and be just as just as deluded, it just doesn't make his case any, any better for him. And the talk of the microchip implantation was, in the judge's words, too much to ignore. So the court revoked Ibiabuchi's bail and instructed that he should undergo a psychiatrist assessment before the case could resume. During this time, Ike's closest friends and family began to make allegations about what happened to Ike in Vegas. Bill Benton believed that Ike was set up, and this is what he said. Do you know the true story about what happened? I don't want to give up any names or anything, but Ike was set up. Real boxing people knew there was nobody around who could whip him. Nobody. They call it, rule it, or ruin it. If they couldn't be the guys pushing the buttons on Ike, then they didn't want him to be a champion. I'm not saying who they were, but there were people in power that thought that way. Ike was a personable guy, a good fighter, and he was set up totally. To this day, he probably doesn't even know what really happened, but I do. There was nobody else around who could beat him, and some people, if they can't sign the fighter, they cut them off instead. Richard Lord, the promoter from earlier in the episode, well, he said a similar thing, and he said, the rumour was Ike had stiffed, as in a promoter, on a fight. He signed to fight, and then something else came up, and he decided to go with another promotion, a different direction. So the story was that this promoter set him up. The next thing, he's in jail, convicted, and in the crazy house. Of course, Ike's mother Patricia would also allege more directly, and she didn't beat around the bush when she said this, that Kushner set her son up. And she said Kushner was hounding Ike to renew his contract with him. Ike informed Cedric that he needed to shop around to have a better understanding of what his worth is. And if he matched it, he would re-sign with him. Cedric was not happy with this because he knew he had been underpaying Ike. Wow, some crazy allegations there. I mean, Kushner's not put himself in a pretty picture let's be honest because is just all about the money but we know that but some of the, the the craziness that some of these guys are coming out of i'm not quite sure I, I, but I, I don't agree with it but bob spagnola he also you know he's bit with me i suppose he disagreed completely he said i don't know if you've been to vegas but it's a pretty dis it's pretty disgusting in a lot of ways you could be walking with your wife or your fiance, and the next thing, someone hands you a picture of a Playboy model offering cheap drinks and an 800 number to call. I guess I walked out in front of the Mirage and started making some calls, and the rest is history. While still waiting to be declared mentally fit to stand trial, several psychiatrists actually examined Ike. Neither were conclusive. Uh, but one comment did ring true with the judge. He doesn't share the same reality as the rest of us in this courtroom. 
It was finally sent to Lakes Crossing Centre for mentally disordered offenders, a maximum security and psychiatric facility, and his mother should have joined him. <laughs> Med- medical experts concluded he exhibited bipolar disorder and a judge granted permission to force medicate him after he refused to take any medication. Eight months later, two years after his arrest, he was ruled competent enough to stand trial. He entered the Alford plea, which is a guilty plea in criminal court, whereby a defendant in a criminal case does not admit the criminal act and ascertains innocence. Therefore, Ike admitted that the evidence presented by the prosecution would be likely to persuade a judge or a jury to find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And he was found guilty of rape. He should have received 10 years to life in prison for for that, basically. But instead, he got two to 10 years for battery with intent to commit a crime and three to 20 years for attempted sexual assault to be served consecutively. He was paroled for the first charge of rape in 2001 and was denied parole on the second charge on four occasions, which was in August 2004, August 2007, February 2009 and May 1st, 2012. When he was refused one of his paroles, Ike actually wrote a letter to Graham, who he blamed. He said, Tim Graham, you bastard. You misinterpreted my opinion on women in your article when you promised me that you would be truthful. You calls me, you calls me my parole, you son of a gun. I don't ever want to see you again. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> it just it just gets worse, doesn't it? I mean, he's he's got all this time to do now in prison as a result of this. But the story just doesn't end there. It really doesn't. Ike's mother, Patricia, she actually wrote an open letter in 2007 which made some very bizarre accusations. And this is what she wrote. It said, Because of these dealers and their methods, we had to leave Dallas and move to Arizona to seek refuge from them. Unfortunately, they followed us to this state and the nightmare continued. They tapped our phones, forced themselves inside our home, they put chemicals in all of our food and drinks, and they would disengage our house alarm and enter our home at any time of the day or night. These promoters went so far as to fly and bring false charges against Ike in Gilbert and Scottsdale where he lived with me in the same house by paying a couple of women to accuse him of attempted kidnapping and sexual assault. The police investigated these charges and threw them out because there was no basis for these charges against him. Since they did not achieve their aim here, they followed him to Las Vegas and repeated the same charges which has kept Ike in jail for six and a half years. Now over the course of the next few years, Patricia continued to make several allegations of rape, further microchip implantations, food poisoning and many more erratic statements. One in particular does demonstrate her mental state of mind at the time when she declared, You may think I'm crazy, but someone came into my home and raped me. They are looking for my eggs so that they can get a heavyweight boxer. This has been going on for 10 years. Incredibly, Patricia was still working as a nurse, even though she's quite clearly unwell, and she's been quite clearly unwell for quite a long time. That was up until March 23rd, 2010, when she was finally revoked of her nursing licence. Less than four years later, On February the 13th, 2014, a few months after Ike's father had passed away, Patricia Ibeabuchi died of a heart attack. Ike Bayabuchi's Facebook page read, The American government should be proud of their wicked murder. We mentioned a few parole hearings that um, that, that failed. Well, there was a total of nine parole hearings over 11 years, and Ike failed to convince the authorities that he should be freed. But by April 2014, Ike was in custody at the Washoe County Jail in Reno, but had been paroled and moved into the custody of the US Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or the ICU, because of his status as a Nigerian national. ICU later revealed that after a hearing in front of an immigration judge, an order was made to have him deported to Nigeria. I'm not surprised if we can ship him out. While awaiting de- deportation, Ike Ibuchi was held 
at ICU's Ilwe Detention Center in Arizona. Nigerian authorities then refused to issue travel documents for his return, and it seemed like I might remain in custody indefinitely in some sort of legal limbo, uh, limbo where he's sort of stuck between two. The Nigerian authorities don't want him, and the USA, they want to get rid of him. But then, on November 24th, 2015, a post appeared on Iabuchi's Facebook page. America is the land of second chance, and when the gates of prison open, the path ahead should lead to a better life. Well, on release, Ike moved to Arizona and began to plan his boxing comeback at the age of 43 with Mike Conts announced as his advisor. It was actually believed that he signed with Manny Pacquiao MP Promotions, uh, something that he later denied that he didn't actually sign for MP Promotions, but was down to fight on the uh, Pacquiao Bradley undercard against the then undefeated Andy Ruiz Jr., uh, 26 and I think he was, but it never happened. Luke Williams finally met Ike on February 17, 2016 for an interview. And they spoke about previous fights, his comebacks and the fights that he missed out on. And he told Luke the Holyfield fight did not happen, nor Lewis or Tyson. Comment on them now would be crying over spilled milk. They spoke about his freedom. Luke asked what it was like to feel free again after 17 years inside. I don't know if I am free yet, he admitted after a pause and his voice almost wistful. I won't feel free until I step into the ring to carry on where I stopped after my 20th fight. So I won't know the answer to that question until I return to the boxing ring. I can't consider myself free until then. Now, less than two months later... Ike Beabuchi was arrested again on April the 7th in Gilbert as part of Operation Justice 2016. This yearly operation coincides with the National Crime Victims Rights Week and the United States Marshal Service, alongside other local, federal and state agencies, target fugitives and criminals with outstanding arrest warrants and apprehend as many as possible in the period of April. Now Ike was on that list because he failed to attend actively participate and remain in sex offender treatment while on probation. Ike was assessed by three psychiatrists. Two said he was competent for trial and one did not, but eventually he was sentenced to three and a half years in Ayman State Prison with 505 days of time served. While in prison, Ike made several appeals, but all of which failed and it was reported that he had committed eight disciplinary infractions, five classified as minors, including disobeying verbal or written orders, and three classified as majors, including disorderly conduct and threatening or intimidating behaviour. According to the Arizona Prisoner Database, something that Luke Williams would check regularly to keep tabs on Ike's movements, Abeyabuchi was released from prison on September the 23rd, 2020, and transferred to immigration custody in Arizona. Now Luke has recently confirmed that he remained there until the summer of this year when he was finally released and went back to Nigeria. And I suppose there's only one way we're going to be able to close this episode and we're going to close it with the words of the author of The President of Pandemonium and an unbelievable book that I think everybody should go and buy and read and this is what he sums up about Ike's dramatic fall that early morning in July, perfectly, and it reads, As Ibeabuchi's demon devoured him, his world title dream, like the dreams of so many gamblers who rode into town before him, proved to be nothing but an illusion. The hotel whose bathroom Ike crouched in as his dreams collapsed around him. The mirage. What do you say? I'm lost for words, mate. <laughs> it's, one of the, it's one of the most compelling tales that we've ever done for the darker side of boxing. I, I think it's got a a mixture of so many different elements to it and what do I feel about it initially my initial reaction to it is that again I think I Abeyabuche was failed by so many people around him like so many of these guys before him he was failed by the people around him Cedric Kushner I think is the first person you point the finger at and you think to yourself originally early in the story early in his life it seemed like he was there with the best of intentions and I think eventually, because of the, the madness that surrounded Abeyabuche and the way he would act, the way things would go, it kind of felt like Kushner had had enough of that and really he was only there for the money. And 
these allegations of him setting him up, well, we're never going to know. I mean, his mum was quite adamant that he was set up, but then his mum was quite adamant that there was demons in the air conditioning and that she had tinfoil on the windows to keep the demons out. So make what you will of that and that comment. But Abayabuchi was quite clearly suffering from some sort of mental illness. Uh, bipolar disorder seems to be the most evident. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a doctor. I can't diagnose. But my, my education on, on these types of illnesses, it seems to be pointing to that direction. So I actually genuinely feel sorry for him from that aspect of his of his life. But I don't feel sorry for him for the crimes that he committed because the crimes that he committed were disgusting. He, he referred to himself in the third person. He had his own persona, this alter ego. And he felt like it was okay to do the things he did to women. And that he had this sort of disdain for women. Even though the biggest influence in his life was his mother. But yet he had this disdain for every other woman he met. It just, it, it's crazy. And obviously the, the, the work that's gone into the book that Luke's done, uh, The President of Pandemonium, really puts a good picture together. And obviously we've used it as a source for this episode. We've used many other sources for this episode. But I can't recommend Luke's book highly enough. And Luke will be on our show as an addendum to this episode to discuss his book and, and discuss his thoughts and feelings on Aika Bayabuchi. And it's going to be really interesting to hear what, what Luke has to say directly about all this. But I'm going to switch it to you now, Johnston, and I want to hear your assessments of uh, Aika Bayabuchi and everything that happened surrounding him and, and what you think ultimately you know, would have helped him or could have helped him. The thing is, is, a lot of people say how bright he was. He was actually quite a clever guy. And I mean, you see it, the brief description we had from his, from his childhood where he was, um, you know, he was a very clever guy clever kid he could have he wanted to be a doctor and he could have pursued that career but you know the Tyson thing sparked something in him he wanted to go and become a boxer so he had he, he was he was very clever uh, but yet he had these these inner demons in him <laughs> uh, where he thought he was these demons were surrounding him in his brain and, and they devoured him as as Luke put it quite cleverly and that that you know it, it was a few olives short of a pizza from the very beginning of his life. And his mum was too. And I think that fight against David Chu is something happened in that, that night. I do believe, you know, the amount of punches he took that night, I think maybe that could have contributed in him get, going away with the fairies and, and, and then him bringing out this president persona inside of him as well. And, and, and clearly he had some sort of issue there. He had leaving the hospital after having a, an MRI and the doctors sort of said, you know, we can see physically your brain's okay, but then you're, you're leaving saying, it's okay, no, it's not from the fighting. It's not from the chew of fight. I ain't getting these edits from that. I'm getting it because I'm, I'm hearing demons in my head. That's when the doctor should be going, wow, like, okay, well, now we know what to do with you. Now we need to send you <laughs> to a psychiatrist. That is the moment, is it not? And then the yep. fact that you've got all of these guys that are around and with all these stories, and some of them are over-exaggerated. Maybe they are. But it does, you know, I think from the words from himself, I think you get the gist and from his mother that they're probably not far from the truth, let's be honest. Um, and I think that those around him just wanted to get him into the ring and into a title fight as soon as they could, so they could earn money from him. As soon as he got that world title, they were going to be raking it in. And that's all they cared about. From the fact that he's hearing dank demons in an airport and Bill Benton's like trying to convince him. I mean, that's not right. The fact that Curtis Coax in that fight before the bird fight, when he, if it's before the bird fight or not, one of the other fights, I can't remember what one it was now, but the one where he's saying, pretend to be, pretend he's the president. You know, Curtis Coax didn't, weren't in his call at that time because he could see that something's not right. I think he's probably the only one there that could see there was troubles and was sort of backing away, but sort of still went with it, but he wasn't happy with it. So they bring in another trainer who just makes up, yeah, yeah, we're just, we're just calling the president just to get him out here. That isn't right. That's manipulation. And that's, that is, it's funny. It is funny. I can't, I, I, at times you're going to hear us laughing during this episode. We can't help it because some of this stuff is incredible. Um, but it's not right because he clearly was unwell. And, and that is the, probably the sickening thing about the whole thing is that these, these guys around him is all about the money and he should have just been sent to a psychiatric facility and, he wouldn't have endangered these women because that's, that's the problem as well. And there is one thing we didn't add to this and it's Ike's opinions of women when he was in prison. And the reason why he kept not getting paroled is the fact that he, the way he see it was these, these women were prostitutes. So, you know, 
if he was in Nigeria, he wouldn't be prosecuted for this. Prostitutes are just nothing, basically, and he could do what he wanted with them. Um, so that that alone, and he still doesn't feel remorse. You don't feel like he gets remorse from that. So he's not right. He's not right, and he should be in prison. Um, but he's in Nigeria now, by the sounds of things. So uh, good luck with uh, their authorities over there with him. <laughs> well, it sounds like that. <laughs> but, it sounds like that's why he's over in Nigeria. If that's exactly, the way he regards women, him. fuck off, I. Right. Tell her, mate, get out, of, get out of America and let Nigeria deal with you. But look, end of the day, he was on the cusp of becoming, of, of fighting for a world title. Would he have won it? It's a big what if. I mean, going back to the boxing side of things, you know, he surely was a contender. He surely was a contender. Unfortunately, we're never going to know because we never got to see them fights with the guys that were around at the time. Holyfield and Lewis were the two men of the division in 1999, circa 2000. They were the two men. They were the fa- the guys that fought each other in 1999 to be the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Ike could have been in that mix. And I think poor decisions being made around him, poor decisions about him were made. And as a result of that, he lost his opportunity. Uh, his, his own mental state of mind lost him the opportunity turning down so much money to fight on the Michael Grant undercard because he felt like mm-hmm. he should have been the top of that card he should have been getting more money and then he comes out randomly talking about he wants five million to fight Lewis do you know this there's, there's, there's a lot that's gone on throughout his life and and parts of me do feel very sorry for for the way that things have gone for him but then also the other side of me feels like well you know he did what he did and he, des- he deserved what he got which was punishment for prison it's just a very, very tortured soul, unfortunately, that has, has clearly slipped through the net and not been dealt with the right way. And, and as far as everybody's aware, he's in Nigeria now. God knows what's happening there. God knows what, what happens next. Could there be more to this story in the future? Quite possibly. There could be more to this story. There could be more things that happen in the future. Who knows? Will he ever return to the ring? It's unlikely, but you just never know. You never, never know. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed this, Johnston. I've really enjoyed Sorry, going man. through, going through the insight of the mind of of Ike Abayabuchi, and we've we've done so well with our pronunciations. I know a lot of people uh, always have a bit of a laugh about the pronunciations of some of the names. I'm pretty sure we've definitely got one wrong throughout the course of this episode. But hey, do you know what? We try our best. I hope you guys obviously enjoyed the episode about Ike Bayabuche. If you have, please do let us know on Twitter at darker underscore side underscore pod. You can let us know on Facebook or on Instagram on the BTR Boxing Podcast Network Facebook page and Instagram page. There's the YouTube channel to subscribe to where all the episodes will be available there too. Johnston, any final thoughts and words before we wrap this up? Just where we started, I caramba. That's what I keep thinking. <laughs> Honestly, unbelievable. What a, what an amazing towel. Absolutely mind-boggling. Wow, what a man. What what the hell happened to that poor man? Uh, and then he just turns into an absolute rapist, sexual assaultist. I don't even know what to say. I mean, it's just, holy shit. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I, I we enjoy putting it together. You know, thank you to Luke. And you know, there is loads of other most of the stuff, not all the stuff, but there's there's a lot of stuff that, that's in here that is not in Luke's book, obviously. We, we've got some other stuff sourced out, but um but massive credit to Luke uh, and and I can't wait to speak to him. Um so yeah, f- listen to that. Follow up. We're gonna follow up on that, you know. So I mean I mean, even if anyone's got any questions for Luke, maybe you could drop us a line and let us know we, when we do meet up with him, have a chat with him. So yeah, looking forward to that. But what a story. Wow. Unbelievable story. We hope you've enjoyed this episode inside the mind of Ike Abayabuche. <laughs>